Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and uh, I wonder where, if you can guess where we are going. Take a look at this spaceship design, and oh yeah, obviously you can see that we are close to Jewel. We have a nuclear rocket, we have some jet engines, and yes, now you can see that we are in fact going to Leith. Now, I've had a few requests for this, so I specifically I want, wanted to address it. Now, Leith is uh, actually one of the easiest moons to go to. Um, after you get through the amount of Delta V needed to get to Joule, it's actually very easy to rendezvous with because it has quite a lot of gravity and uh, it's very close to a large body. And you know, to get uh, an intercept course with the planet Joule is actually really easy because the sphere of influence is humongous compared to most other planets. It's actually easier to go from Kerbin to uh, Joule than it is to plot a course from Kerbin to either Eve or uh, Duna. So I know, yeah, we're just kind of flying around. I've been adjusting my course and I've obviously cut a whole lot out. The interesting thing about Leith, I'm sure you all know, is that it is almost entirely covered in water. There are a few landing sites that you can land on, but um, I know for a fact it is possible to land on the oceans because the way the game works is that everything is buoyant and uh, it's just a question of stability. So you have to design your spacecraft to be flat and wide so it does not flip over. Another thing about Leith is it has an atmosphere. The atmosphere is uh, 55 kilometers high. It's almost as dense as that on Kerbin. Similarly, the planet itself is about, you know, four fifths of Kerbin and the surface gravity is about four fifths Kerbin. So it's just slightly easier than the planet Kerbin in many ways. So yeah, I'm screaming through the upper atmosphere. I'm burning whatever fuel I can on this nuclear engine because it might make things a little easier. Um, or maybe I just don't want to drop radioactive fuel tank into the ocean because there might be things living in there, who knows? But we are going to land and we are going to find out if this is where the space kraken really lives. So yeah, we get down and deploy the parachutes. Now you see I'm going to use mechanical jab just to hold its position. The, the position is set for 1990, so everything's vertical. And because the atmosphere is similar to that of Kerbin, I can use the jet engines. And here's the, intri here's the hard part, I guess. The jet engines, because they have spool up and spool down times, are very hard to land on normally. But I'm not really killing all of the velocity with the jet engines. I just need to touch down relatively slowly. So the first thing I do is I'm killing my velocity so that when the parachutes open, they don't tear my ship apart. Now I just need to kind of jockey this down and make sure I don't hit the ocean surface too fast. Not a trivial thing, again, considering the spool up and spool down time on these things, but I don't think it is beyond my abilities. You just have to be very careful and think ahead. Uh, the other thing is the parachutes are going to basically hold us the right way up, rather than, say, letting us flip over one way or another. So this is entirely working with the shift and control keys. I could probably turn off mechanical jab if I wanted to, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, I've got other things going on. You see, uh, we're down to now 100 something meters, so I'm bringing the thrust up a little. But uh, I'm trying to not overdo it because this thing does take a moment to react and we don't want to end up going upwards when we want to be going downwards. Uh, jet engines are of course ridiculously fuel efficient so we don't really need to worry too much about loiter time here in the landing. Similarly we don't actually need to worry too much about the velocity it's just as long as it's slow. Uh, we're going to hit the ocean, we're about 10, 15 meters up, we can see the jet streams hitting the surface. And there we are, just cut the power, let it float in and sink down, and it does not flip over. Look at that. There we go. We are on the surface of Leith and we are not sinking. And uh, the game at this time does not actually render engines non-functional if they are underwater, so you can hear them still running. Let's get out and go for a swim. There we go. Bill in the water there. Let's uh, swim around. No uh, Kraken here, because of course the Kraken was the Space Kraken. It has nothing to do with the actual uh, serpent that lives in this ocean. 
Yeah, not much to see, unfortunately, here, because it is a planet entirely covered with uh, water. Now, some of you might actually be wondering, how come uh, if we have the frozen waste of the, on the poles of the planets, how come Lath is covered with water when it is so far away from the, the sun Kerbal? Well, the astute observers will have noticed that there are multiple satellites in orbit around the planet Joule, and their, peri their periods share a 1 to 2 to 4 resonance. That means that for every four times um, Lath goes around, the next planet out, which I forget the name of, <laughs> I think it's Tylo is next, or ah, I'm getting it off in my head. But basically the point is that these things line up every uh, four orbits of, of Joule. And this is a sa the same kind of thing we see in the solar system with the planets, uh, the moons Io, Europa, and Ganymede. They basically keep each other um, in this oscillation. They squeeze Io and Europa, and they make them way warmer than they thought. Initially, we thought that Io was going to be a dead planet, but it turns out that it has volcanic activity because it's in this fantastic um, resonance that pumps energy into the system and gives us volcanoes. But anyway, we are lifting off and I'm just going to skip through all this because once we're out of the ocean, it is a standard launch. The atmosphere is a little thinner, so uh, we switch over to the rockets earlier. We're still sucking fuel from those um, engines there, but because I've built flat and wide, I've used the little engines and just used lots of them. So. You know, I, it's not the most efficient design in terms of mass, but we're making concessions because we want to make it flat and wide. So there we go, ditching the engines, and now it's just a straight rocket boost into orbit. And, uh, yep, getting up to speed. We're going to get into orbit easily enough, but of course, we're still a long way from home, and I've kind of designed this in mind with a, a return trajectory in mind. And now, people who've come out to Joule will realize that you have to burn a lot of fuel to get out here. It's the furthest planet out. But once you get captured, it actually requires a lot less uh, fuel to return than you would expect. So this is me just circularizing my orbit. You see that I have, you know, still have those three tanks. Those uh, engines are nice and efficient all the way, well, over most range of altitudes, actually. So I like to use them. They've kind of nerfed the efficiency. They used to be ISP of 400, now they're 300. But yep, here we are just orbiting around. There's the beautiful green giant, the jolly green giant, the jewelly green giant even. There you go. Uh, I'm starting to wonder where they came up with the names for these planets, really. So yeah, the jewelly green giant rising over the planet Lath. Ah, what a view. Okay, well, let's start working on our return trajectory. So, we're in orbit. We want to bring our dual periaps down. Obviously, we've tried to mess around and wait for the correct window. And uh, that's kind of hard because I was in low orbit and it did take a while. But yeah, just bring my, myself down to about 150 kilometers, just above the cloud tops of dual. Uh, you do not want to overestimate your... Um, aero braking on Joule, it will suck you in and kill you. It is not, uh, it is not particularly forgiving. Let's say goodbye to Lath and those tiny patches of land. So yeah, here we are. We come down. We get into the the Joule periaps or a peri Joule, let us call it. And now we're gonna go prograde and burn for everything we've got. Burn, burn, burn. And taking, of course, full advantage of the Oberth effect to get the maximum thrust out of here, right? Because we're going into an escape trajectory, we can really take advantage of this small boost here. So, yeah, we're, uh, we've lined up the periaps with the, the retrograde point in the orbit. And here we go, zooming out, just uh, skipping out into another escape trajectory. It wasn't perfectly lined up, but that's fine. We get the trajectory down to curb in distance. And uh, now the trick is to align the orbits. And this is a very long, boring process, which in fact I had to reload several times as I kept missing. But 
Eventually, I got that golden encounter. Everything was wonderful, and we adjusted it down, tweaked our orbit just a little, and got ourselves. We just had to get close enough to aero brake. There we go. And you see that we did not have much fuel left. We uh, really, <laughs> we really managed this and only just. <laughs> it's always nice to see uh, this. I mean, actually, the, the, the rocket that launched this was about the same size as the rocket that launched the initial mission to Duna. It does not take a huge rocket to do this. Um, partly because you can use jet engines for the return. You can really make things more efficient. Um, I'm sure the design isn't perfect. You could make it wider and flatter. And of course, you could make a three-man version, which I have not done here. You could probably put in a wider margin for safety, of course. One of the reasons I didn't end up using the nuclear rocket is because it is so long, I was concerned it would make the, the vehicle capsize. But I'm sure there's some budding rocket engineers out there that will design around that particular drawback. Anyway, the mission was successful. It is time for me to say farewell and for Bill to dry himself off with a towel. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.